The clickbaity title, I'll admit. Uh, we aren't going to be doing any real-life cloning today, but uh, hopefully uh, it's, a, it's a fun way to sort of explore some of the principles of uh, Azure Custom Neural Voice and some of the surrounding services that Azure offers us. Um, let me... There we go. All righty. So, uh, I'm Callum. Um, I'm on Twitter. You can find me there, Callum B. White. Uh, yeah, still. Um, so, I, uh, I'm an Umbraco MVP. Umbraco is an open source .NET CMS. I'm also a Microsoft MVP for a few years now. Um, I'm a .NET developer by trade, uh, but nowadays I, uh, I run my own business. I'm, uh, I've got a small agency based here in the UK, and we're doing Umbraco and .NET solutions. Um, obligatory, we're hiring, if you'd like to talk to me after. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm running a business day to day now. Um, doing less and less code, unfortunately. Tech's still very much my passion. Um, I speak at quite a lot of events. I was in the Netherlands last week, for example. Um, I also organize my own events. I work on my own open source packages. I, uh, as, well, as a white male in tech, I have a podcast, a weekly podcast. I um, feel like that's obligatory at this point. Um, it's a, sad to say. Uh, I also have a load of passions outside of coding, like I, I love cooking, especially Italian cuisine and the culture. Um, I really like traveling. I've been to the US and Australia just in the past couple of months. Uh, now, why am I telling you all of this? Where the hell do I find the time? <laughs> because this is a lot to do, and I'm, I'm sure hopefully some of you here can empathize. This is, uh, this is maybe too much to be doing. Well, the truth is, and it's been speculated, I have an army of clones. Um, this is me in the middle. Callum A. White on the side looks to be related to Dylan Beatty, I think. He's got the same hat and glasses. And Callum, well, Callum M. C. White is a, uh, a rapper with gold teeth. And uh, unfortunately, we can't choose our clones. They're not, they're not hugely helpful to me. It would be great if I had you know, a chef, maybe someone that could do the talking, someone that could do the traveling for me, run the business. Unfortunately, not. However, can we actually clone ourselves? No. The answer is no. The technology hasn't really evolved at this point to allow us to get into a, a capsule like this and create an identical clone of ourselves. But we're going to have a look at some fun ways we could do uh, some different things, maybe make our lives slightly more efficient. Um, everybody at some point in here has probably wished they had a clone or another pair of hands or something. Um, Maybe someone to do the dishes uh, when they're, when they're you know, busy or doing some exercise. Uh, someone that could get their work done twice as fast. It would be really helpful. Now, the, sort of, the premise of this talk, the idea was inspired by a video I saw during COVID. Now, this, this guy here is uh, Jesse Oral, and he's a video producer for CNET. Did anyone see this video? It went kind of viral. Maybe, maybe not. So Jesse decided he was going to augment his presence in his... Zoom meetings or his, his stand-ups, etc., for a whole week. And he set about, I, I highly recommend watching this video, he set about uh, recording clips and kind of the typical responses that you'd get in these meetings. Like, yeah, nothing from me, or nodding, those sorts of things. He recorded the videos, he recorded the audio, he sliced it all up. And whilst he didn't fully automate this, he still had to sit there and drive. He didn't have to speak to anyone for a whole week. He predicted all the different things that he may have to say. Even his, uh, I've not got a clip, but even at one point he gives a, a proper update on a project that he's just recorded. And uh, yeah, it, it's very, very entertaining to watch. Um, but this gave me a thought, right? Like, I do a lot of calls. I, uh, I attend a lot of meetups and things. Maybe I could augment my presence in, in some of these too. Wouldn't that be cool? Maybe a, a mini me that can do some of the grunt work. Um, around the same time as this, I actually saw a really fascinating video from Donovan Brown at Microsoft. And he was showing the Azure speech synthesizer, this, this new service that they were coming out with, to effectively narrate a video. And during this video, he revealed every bit of audio you've listened to so far has been my synthesized voice. And that blew my mind because it looked and it sounded, or it sounded, it didn't look, uh, it sounded exactly like him, exactly like he was speaking. And okay, when you looked it back, there was a, a few obvious tells, but it was more or less uh, his voice. I was really impressed and inspired. So I went away, tried to replicate Jesse's idea here, see if I could maybe create a clone of my voice. Well, AI platforms in recent years have obviously come on a very long way. 
Uh, they're becoming more powerful and more accessible. I think that's the crucial point. Whilst the AI and the ML technology has got better, it's also become more widely available, easier for us to use as developers. We can access it through very simple and affordable APIs now, or run it even directly on our machines because they're being optimized further. Um, some notable examples of this, uh, and I'm sure everyone will be familiar with ChatGPT. ChatGPT has sort of uh, exploded since November when it came out. It's gone very mainstream. Even this morning, I saw on BBC News that the chancellor of this country, love him or hate him, made some remark about having his speech written for him by ChatGPT. It's a, a piece of technology that's just yeah, gone completely crazy. I'm sure people have experimented with it. Um, it's bit made by OpenAI, very, very cool proof of a conversational AI trained on data from 2021 that you can actually make semi-believable human interactions with. Um, they also, I think in 2021 as well, OpenAI came out with DALI 2, which you may have seen for generating those um, AI, AI generated artwork, which was, yeah, pretty cool looking. Um, and you can get some quite funky results out of it. There's a huge array of pre-trained models and services available for us, so we don't have to worry anymore about going and training our model from scratch. Um, with Azure services like cognitive services, you've got vision, custom vision, um, you've got speech, which we're gonna look at today, language, um, you know, patterns, those sorts of things. So, so many uh, different options available. Um, and even just last week, Azure unveiled their new open AI service, so you can, have access to the full OpenAI suite of models. They've got, I think, a few hundred models in there for you to go away and train and do whatever you want to do on Azure's platform. Microsoft are increasingly making ties with OpenAI to, uh, to do more powerful things. So it's really, really interesting time. Um, I even saw a recent example where uh, somebody had set up ChatGPT, so a conversational AI, plus some voice synthesizer, I can't quite remember what it was, to call up their bank and request a refund on their credit card. And this was a clip on, uh, on Twitter, which was, you know, again, maybe not flawless, but a, a pretty cool use of the technology. Um, it it's kind of shows exactly where AI and uh, ML and speech synthesis could really be going. Okay, so... Cloning my voice would be awesome. We've established that. I could get so, many, so much more time back for myself. Um, perhaps in future, I wouldn't have to be standing up here and delivering the talk. I could you know, sit down, have a cup of tea, and you could just listen to my synthesized voice. It wouldn't be so fun. But this is sort of the idea we're going to look at today. Could I clone my voice with the services we have available? So to do this first, we've got to start with a bit of a science lesson. So you'll have to humor me for a bit. Um, this is the vocal system of a human. Um, so the way that we produce noise, sound, the way we speak, we take air from our lungs and our diaphragm pushes that up through our windpipe, our, our trachea, and then through the voice box. The voice box, which is this uh, uh, bit in the middle, the larynx and the vocal cord, um, they vibrate, they create a vibration. And then we use that vibration with our tongue to make different shapes and therefore sounds with our mouth, our lips, our teeth, various different things. So that's how our, our biological uh, noise maker works. This is the same in monkeys and many other animals. Uh, you'll notice the, uh, the vocal cord sort of looks like a pair of lips there. It's effectively a valve where these uh, valves, the, the openings of that valve will change shape and vibrate accordingly to how much energy you're pushing through your, uh, through, through your uh, windpipe and the noise you need to make. It's incredibly remarkable. I've, there's some very gruesome pictures of how this actually works online, and I wasn't going to put them up there for you today on a Friday morning. Um, but from a technical point of view, we're pushing air through a chamber, vibrating, and then using something to filter and direct that noise, those vibrations, that air, to make the sounds we need to do to communicate. Now we also have to talk about some other things, maybe more in the acoustics space here. So sonority um, is a word that we're not gonna talk about too much, but it's a concept you're gonna need to understand. Sonority is the amount of energy that a sound makes. So effectively, how, how big that vibration that your, uh, that your voice box needs to make is to actually make the sound you're, you're trying to do. 
Um, you'll be very familiar from, say, language lessons of what vowels are. Vowels are, of course, uh, a sound that have a bit more of an open, uh, they're more of an open sound with more energy. So if you think of ooh, ah type things, hopefully you'll be saying that after my talk, um, those, are, those are bigger sounds. Your uh, voice box is more open during those and is vibrating more. You also have consonants, which are a commonplace in most languages too. These are those shorter sounds that require less energy, a t sound or a k sound. Those are, those are far more subtle sounds um, that require less vibration. Syllables, hopefully we understand what a syllable is. It's a group of sounds. Uh, and in this case, a syllable usually has a peak. So if you think of the word ball, it's a single syllable word. The peak in that is the B, the letter B, because it's the strongest. And uh, it has the most emphasis on it. The A or the OR sound is more of an open uh, vowel noise, as we said. It's a, a more elongated noise. And the U sound is very short consonant. So the B, in that case, has the most emphasis on it, the most energy that your voice uses to produce that sound. And then uh, the next one is a phoneme. This is the attribute of a word that makes it unique. So if you think of can and man, very similar sound, sounding words. The only thing that's changed is the, the emphasis there, the M versus the C, uh, ball, tall, etc. cetera. Um, you can see that the phoneme is the sort of unique bit of that, of that sound that's making that word what you understand it to be. And finally, there's some other uh, Acoustic devices, shall we say, things like sibilants. If you're saying a, well, even the word sibilants, it makes like a s sound. And that's a, a key part of our speech. These things differ per language, but in English, these are sort of the most commonly used elements. And I could do a whole talk probably on uh, the acoustics of speech. Unfortunately, I'm not an expert on that. Um, hopefully, I've tried to explain those concepts well. Now, it is important to understand these, and, and why I'm telling you this is because if we're going to look at an AI or a computer understanding how to augment speech, it sort of needs to understand the structure of language and the structure of speech as well. So uh, these concepts will be uh, kind of an underlaying tone throughout all the technology we're going to look at. So uh, if anyone was in here just before I started, you'll see me testing this clip, but uh, I'm a big Apple fan. I'm sorry, I know, I know it's not for everyone. But uh, back in the 1980s when Apple introduced the Macintosh, Steve Jobs had a, uh, a thing of, it has to say hello, the machine has to speak. They were trying to show off the capabilities of their new processor and that they could do um, this fantastic speech augmentation directly on the device. It was pretty groundbreaking at the time. Um, if you've seen the movie Jobs, I think it's uh, Michael Fassbender movie, there's, there's a famous clip from this where he's enraged that it has to say hello. Um, here's an example. Hello, I am Macintosh. It sure is great to get out of that bag. Right, so uh, it, of course they, they made it a little bit funny, but uh, that's a computer speaking in the 1980s. Uh, and it doesn't sound great, it doesn't sound like a human. It's not really uh, a very natural sounding voice, but it's a computer speaking. How do we make a computer speak. Well, we're going to look at that again. And we're going to start with a bit of a history lesson. I'm sorry, a little bit, a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, academia. Um, so does anyone know what this machine is? Go on, just shout it out. Sonograph? No, it's not a sonograph. OK, well, I'll tell you. It's a vocoder, or what it became known as was the voda, actually. Um, it's, uh, vocoder is a... Uh, portmanteau of the, word vo the, vo the words voice encoder. This is a picture from 1938, where at the uh, Bell Laboratories, which became AT&T in the US, they were inventing a voice encoder, uh, a way of synthesizing human speech with a machine. Uh, this was invented by Homer Dudley in uh, 1938, as I said. Um, so the idea of this is it's an incredibly scary looking machine, um, is it takes electrical vibrations or a frequency and measures that over time. It passes that through a number of filters to kind of you know, strip out the noise and the bits it doesn't need or doesn't want. And uh, then it sends those electrical signals to a noise generator. They call it a noise generator because it's not like, say, the modern day speakers that we have. It's maybe more akin to, say, 
the buzzer, if you've done any electronics where you've got like a little you know, buzzer, it just vibrates. It's more akin to that. Um, and so through those electrical signals you pass it, it will measure that and generate an output through various filters. Um, this evolved over time. This technology was obviously very primitive. But uh, in World War II, it was used for scrambling phone calls between, say, the president of the US and, uh, and the UK or other countries. Um, it's also started to then feature, as time's gone on, in popular culture. So in the 1960s and 70s, when synthesizers became all the rage, uh, it started being incorporated into those musical synthesizers. Synthesizers work in a very similar way. They take an electrical signal and a pulse, and it sort of mutates that, and it, it oscillates around, uh, around a, a frequency to output a sound. So they were able to integrate these vocoder devices into your, uh, your typical uh, music-making machines, such as this. This is a Korg vocoder from the 1970s. It's attached to a keyboard, and as you play the different keys, it will, as I said, change the sound. So you can, through this microphone, input the kind of the frequencies that you want. You can effectively sing to it, and it will mutate that as you play the different keys. Um, and you may be thinking, oh, this sounds quite good. I've, I've never heard any music like that. I guarantee you have. And I'm sorry. I hope this doesn't copyright strike the, uh, the stream in any way. I'm only going to play like five seconds of it. There we go. So this is a famous song from the 1980s. It's Earth, Wind and Fire's Let's Groove, if you're not aware. I will stop that now because this is going to get a bit annoying. Um, but it's used, in, it's used in popular culture. It's being used in music throughout the 1980s and 90s and still in modern day. Of course, nowadays, we've probably got digital versions of this. We weren't using a, a Korg vocoder uh, anymore. But the principle applies, taking an electrical signal, a waveform, mutating it with the different keys in the music that you need, and then outputting an end signal. Nowadays, pretty much everyone has a vocoder in some form, probably on their person. If you've got a smartphone, your smartphone can speak. You have Siri or Google Assistant or Alexa. Those are able to augment sounds. And yes, it's a digital implementation of one, but you're probably using one almost on a daily basis. If you've got the bus or the tube here, you will have heard an automated voice today announcing the stop or the station. Again, it's using the same core technology that's just evolved a bit over time into digital forms. Right, now we can talk a bit about ML. So we've, we've learned the history and sort of how noise is made from the human voice box all the way to digitized voices with a vocoder. Well, we also need to learn some core principles of ML uh, to actually understand how we're gonna generate and augment this voice. So an ML model, that's the key word here, uh, is designed to sort of recognize patterns. If we want to be really, really overly simplistic, it's statistics. It's going to find a bunch of data points and find the common data points within those and decide on that being the answer to a problem. The reality is it's much more complicated. You have algorithms that will do that determination. And it's not just a, uh, you know, a zero and a one. It's trillions of operations or different uh, data points. But the principle still applies. So models use these algorithms, and uh, in turn, it sort of learns. Learns is a, is a strong term here. It's, it's just finding patterns and remembering those patterns and uh, improving its statistics based on the existing data that it knows, really. Now, training is the most important part of a model. The model is effectively the algorithm and maybe some base data. Training is what we're then saying, OK, here's my real-world scenario, actual data that I would like to use to tune this model to my uh, use case. So that could be audio or text or any, any sort of data, really, attributes of a car, if you'd seen the previous talk about uh, data analytics. Um, these techniques that would get used in training an ML, uh, an ML model, sorry, are not too dissimilar from that example I showed you earlier with Jesse Ordel, or Oral, sorry, doing his, uh, his augmenting himself in calls for a week. What he's done is decided the different things that he needs to be able to do or to kind of augment his presence somewhere. Is that me? That's me. <laughs> I'm sorry. We'll turn the audio off for now. I don't know what that was. Um, 
Yeah, so Jesse Oral took different, uh, different clips, different bits of information he needed to communicate and split those up into tiny little segments. So he sort of worked out every, every possibility he may, may need to be able to say and then uh, built up a, a library of that. Uh, let's call that training, if you will. And then to actually execute and use that data, he was just picking and choosing things. But in reality, you'd hope that a machine would be able to determine, I need to play this clip now or this clip now. He's given a load of data points and he's using them. It's quite powerful. He also identified his patterns in the call. I've not shown the clip, but he had things like nodding, all good, which I'm sure a lot of you spend lots of your times on Teams and Zoom calls going, yep, fine, all good. So he was able to just augment that sort of thing. It's things that we can train an AI to say, well, here's you know, five variations of, of that and play those at different times. Um, so yeah. Uh, the reality is as well, again, I didn't show the clip, but he only used an incredibly small subset of all of those videos he created. He created a few hundred videos and the nodding and the sort of general things actually is all, all he really needed. So you could, you could call that like a condensation of his, uh, of his model. He's deciding he only needs these core things and that's his, his base and if he wanted to improve that in future, he could, he could add on to it. So that's sort of what, what training an AI would be in, in, in a practical sense. I mentioned it's all about statistics. So if we take this from a realistic scenario, I've got a linear, uh, a linear set of data from a zero to a one, and if I don't give it anything, it assumes either that's somewhere in the middle of that or it's null, but let's assume we've given it both a zero and a one, so therefore, statistically, my data is a 0 0.5 because I've got two, two data points, I'm halfway between the two. The more data we give this, the more valuable this becomes. Very crude example again, single data point. But if I've plotted 15 different points on a, on a linear line and said, this is uh, all of the data I have on this particular attribute, it will work out, okay, that's 0.85 is, is the sort of average there. It's all averages. AI has a, uh, effectively works on a mean average model to work all of this thing, these things out. Um, as I said, the reality is this is far more complex. There's trillions of data points. If we're talking about audio, that could be any one component of those, um, any one component of those uh, different acoustic features of, of audio or linguistic features um, that we discussed before. So there's a few different ways of training a model. Um, you take a data set, let's, let's call it audio in our case, and that gets passed to the model. The model is an algorithm, it works out the attributes it needs and extrapolates all of those statistics from that and stores that in a, in a format where it could be uh, executed later. You give it a task, if you will. That task could be find me the most common you know, word that's said in, these, in this book um, or the most common patterns of words in this book. Now, when you're doing something called isolated learning, you'll do that and you maybe take the same data set and give that to several different tasks. Or you may take different data sets and give it to the same task or different data sets and give it to different tasks. But the reality is you will get a different output basically every time you run this because it doesn't learn from what it did previously. The learning is only based on the data you've given it and the task that it's completed. It doesn't know what happened in task one in task three. So more modern AI techniques are using something called transfer learning. Transfer learning is a way of passing the result of a given task, go work out the most common you know, X feature, to the next task, and the next task, and the next task. And it will go through and learn cumulatively. This is how we can build up far more intelligent platforms. Again, these sorts of technologies have been widely applied. ChatGPT has been trained on this exact uh, technique. It's very common in natural language processing because it needs to learn over time. You can't chuck the entire English language at an AI and expect it to just understand. You have to build up that understanding. Okay. Enough of the basics. We've covered the principles. We're now actually going to look at some, uh, some configuration and uh, a bit of code as well. So Azure Custom Voice is a service from Azure, and it allows us to do basically everything we've just looked at um, in a far more simple way. We don't have to understand those concepts, but it's, it's pretty helpful. Uh, it's basically a set of core models. They've gone and trained those existing speech synthesis models, or let's call them text-to-speech models to understand when I give it this text, a human would have said this, and the computer needs to output some kind of signal to 
a system that will generate a voice uh, for that. Um, it's using a neural ML model, a deep learning model. So they've effectively left this to run on a huge data set of several thousand hours of audio to actually work this out in many, many different languages too. So what we're going to look at today is how you could potentially train your Azure custom voice model to sound like you or to um, maybe say things the way you say them. There's two plans, a light and a pro plan. Now, unlike most other Azure services, there's no cost difference between these. It's a access difference. The light plan is widely available. Anyone can go and use this, but it won't let you do basically anything other than train a model and have a, a working demo. If you wanted to use this in the real world, you have to have the pro plan. And to use the pro plan, you have to request access from Microsoft. Now, as soon as I saw that, I thought, well, that's a bit rubbish. Why, why do I have to go and ask for, for access to something? Um, they made me fill in a form that says exactly what I'm going to be using it for and why and how and uh, you know, whose voice I'm going to be using and how many people I'm going to be showing it to here. And then I started to think about it. Well, actually, this is quite important, and you'll see why in a second. OK, so how does this service actually work under the hood? I explained that it's effectively a, co a common text-to-speech scenario where you give it some text, it will run that through your model that you've trained up, and it will output the audio. Well, we're starting to see some patterns here that we've already discussed. Text, ignore that bit, but we have our neural model in there. That's our trained model. That's all of the statistical data about our voice and, and the text that we've, we've told it to, to go and understand. We then have a vocoder. This is a digital version of that incredibly crude uh, 1930s machine I showed you, but it's effectively going to do that in a digital form. Take a signal and augment a voice accordingly. So this is how, how you would actually consume it and how it would work if you sent some text and requested it. Um, but how it actually works under the hood with regards to the training um, is, let's divide this into two parts. We've got the, the core model training, which you don't have to do on a daily basis because Microsoft has done this for you. They've trained, as I said, 3,000 hours of multilingual, multi-speaker uh, content across multiple different languages. They've trained that through their deep learning um, algorithms and models and generated this thing called a transformer uh, and then they apply various different fine tunings and techniques to actually get a model that is generally usable. Um, where we come in is we're going to give it some speech, some, some data. They've said here around two hours of speech would be uh, about the minimum. Um, and then we call that our student training data. This is the, uh, this is the actual data that we're trying to enhance the, the base model with. That then runs through a couple of other algorithms, one called fast speech, which just improves the accuracy and the speed of training. Um, there's a fantastic white paper from the, the team behind this at Microsoft. It's all sort of publicly available, and they've, they've, they've shared this knowledge widely. Um, equally, this uh, transformer, as you can see on the, uh, the far left side there, was actually developed by Google in 2017. Again, it's a white paper. So we're, we're standing on the shoulders of everyone else here trying to, uh, to build a, uh, a sort of intelligent... Uh, model, or a more efficient model, should we say. So then you train your model with your student data using these uh, algorithms, and then finally uh, we have our model, which we can consume in the previous step. That's our neural acoustic model. The digital vocoder is sort of handled for us. Um, so as I said, there's, it's, all about, um, it's all about averages when we're talking about uh, AI. It's going to go and work out the uh, sort of... Uh, yeah, how best your voice maps to their model. And from what their research shows is they've got a sort of 4.1 uh, mean opinion score, MOS. MOS is a common term used in the AI community to sort of establish how accurate a model is. So when you're scoring and deciding if it's meeting your requirements. They've got a, effectively an 82% accuracy rate with their, with their model. Um, I think the reality is it's probably a bit higher, as we should see in a minute. Now, I mentioned that I had to access, uh, request access to get full pro, uh, pro tier usage. Um, this is because uh, it's, it's basically a safeguard. It's to avoid uh, people misusing the service, to ensure responsible use. It helps restrict exactly what you're going to use the service for and make sure it's an appropriate use case. It means we can avoid things like deep fakes. You don't want to post a video of yourself on YouTube and then anyone to be able to take that audio and just make a copy of your voice, do you? 
um, without your permission. So they ask for things like a talent statement where you have to speak and say, this is me and I consent that my voice will be used. And then they match that against the model to make sure that it's you. On the light tier, they only restrict you to a very select number of statements that you can actually output from your model, um, effectively demo text. And then you need Microsoft's a, a, you know, approval to be able to go ahead and do this. Uh, as I've said here, kind of a joke. We don't want Troy Hunt in a few years' time standing up here doing a talk going, has your voice been pwned because someone ripped it off YouTube and made a, a deep fake. Um, as well, if you saw Michelle's session yesterday, she talked a lot about uh, how Microsoft has been taking sort of responsible AI really seriously. It's a, it's a big responsibility for everyone using these tools to do so in a responsible fashion. So this is how Microsoft has done it. They've sort of put all the cool stuff behind, behind a gate. Now, you're, as that's why the cost is the same. You're getting the same tools. You're getting more or less the same algorithms, but you've not got the full scope of capabilities. We'll talk a little bit about pricing later. OK, now we can get down to actually training our, our model. For training light, this is the, the free plan, let's call it. Um, on, it very, very much not free. Uh, the, 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 uh, <laughs> the accessible plan, let's say. Um, it, it will give you moderate quality audio output um, and with a moderate amount of effort for input. So uh, we're going to use this word utterances quite a lot. Utterances would just be a word. Um, I don't know if you'd call A a word, but A would count as an utterance. It's uh, yeah, elements of a sentence, shall we say, um, or fr phrases, more like. Um, we have to record 20 to 50 of these. The more data we give our model, the more accurate it's going to be because the more statistics it can extract from that. Um, Microsoft have a fantastic self-service tool, actually, that, uh, that allows us to go record these things in the browser and then uh, deploy that model if we have access to the pro plan to use that widely across their um, other cognitive services like custom text-to-speech. So you could have a virtual assistant that speaks exactly like you if you really wanted that. Um, now, of course, Generally, the better quality your recordings are here, the better quality the output's going to be. Um, but for this demo that I'm about to do, I've uh, tested this just on a laptop microphone, and I thought that would be a bit more fair. I also live next to a very noisy road, so I didn't record this in ideal conditions. And uh, yeah, it was uh, pretty interesting to see the results. Let's, uh, let's go take a look. Let me see if I can work this bit out. There we go. I've actually been having a problem with Azure this morning, so let's see if this works. If not, I've got a backup, so that should be fine. See, it's throwing me around. Right, nope, we're going to go to the backup. I'll have to change one of the demos that comes up, but that's fine. Um, let's zoom that in a bit. Oh, of course, this is going to send me through this now, isn't it? Hopefully, I don't need to do 2FA or anything. <laughs> Give me a second. Um, I'm in the wrong directory. So we'll change to that one. Actually, resource. Oops. Change directory. Nothing like a live demo, right? <sighs> and then it's probably still put me in the wrong service switch. Yeah, fine. OK. We're back on track. Hopefully, we've got my some of my pre-trained models. The reason I wanted to use that subscription is I have access to the pro uh, tier on there, and I could show you a fully deployed model. It's clearly not going to work for us today. But I can still show you some actually uh, you know, trained working models on the light tier, and it's, I think, still equally impressive. So um, this is Azure Speech Studio. Uh, Microsoft has a variety of different studios for different AI products. So they've got a Vision Studio um, and uh, various different other platforms. This is where you would go to manage and create and train your AI model um, for your custom neural voice service. If I just go right back to the very start here, oh, I am on the start, you'll see they've, they've got a wide array of services and capabilities that they sort of walk you through. So um, speech to text, different scenarios there, how you could do uh, real-time translation, and also the reverse, text-to-speech. They've got a fantastic library of pre-made voices if you wanted to choose one, and it will probably work in most cases because training your own voice, as we'll see, is a little bit difficult. Um, and then there's also more controls where you can you know, create things like a custom virtual assistant. We're going to have a look at all of this. So uh, the service we're using today is called Custom Voice, and let's just dive into that one. Now, I've got a few pre-trained ones here um, that we're going we're gonna to look at over time. Um, but I'll show you just how easy it would be to actually create a new 
project. So I can go into the Speech Studio, I can choose my project type. Uh, in this case, I'm choosing the Light project. It explains here it's 20 to 50 utterances, and uh, I can sort of do this pretty quickly. It's good for demonstrations. I click Next. We'll give it a name. We'll just call it uh, NDC London. Uh, and then I choose my gender, which is uh, perhaps a little controversial, but it's necessary because there's a different model depending on the data that's been, th that you give it. So this is quite important. I've played with different settings here, and if you don't get it right, you'll end up with a very strange sounding uh, AI. So choose what you think will best align with your voice and go with that. Um, there's also a lot of different languages we can choose from. Um, in this case, English US is, uh, what are you looking for, Denny? There is not Dutch, I'm sorry. Um, but we have, we have some common, pretty common languages, French, German, Italian. I think it's basically where they were able to source enough data about, uh, or enough, enough of a sample. Um, some big differences between English UK and US. We are in uh, the UK, so I'm going to go with English UK, but English US has a much bigger feature set. They've clearly just got more data there, and there's a lot of features in preview for the English UK platform. Anyway, we agree to their code of conduct, we agree to the, uh, the responsible practices, and it's instantly created my project, so that's good. No waiting around here. Uh, now, this is how we go ahead and get started with training our model. It sort of explains it here. You're going to record some data, you're going to train it, you're then going to test it, and if you have full access, you can go and deploy it. So I will click Get Started. Now, I'm not going to, oh yeah, more disclaimers. Agree, yeah, sure, accept, that's fine. Okay, so it's going to do a noise check. And as I said, I'm just using my laptop microphone here, but I will hit Allow. We'll try it again. It's not liking it. Fine. Uh, let's, uh, let's not worry. We'll just say got it. Um, whilst they are here trying to guide you to, to sort of train up the best quality model you can, it's a it is a bit forgiving. So um, there's some examples where you just maybe can't get the pronunciation right, or uh, I don't know. And then you have to uh, uh, you just have to go next. Um, it will guide you through the process here. So there is. Uh, a minimum of 20 samples required, and I have to go through and train this model by speaking to it, and uh, it will listen to the input on my microphone, match it to make sure it's you know, clearly pronounced, it's uh, got all of the words that it expected in there, and then if it's all good, it will give me a green tick, and I can move on to the next utterance. Uh, if there's, you can train up to 50, 50 sentences here, 50 utterances, sorry, and as I said, that sort of improves the quality. I'm not going to sit here and do all 50. Uh, it takes about 15 minutes, in my experience, to go through and do the whole lot. Um, but I'll just do one to show you exactly how it works, if this, if this is going to work. Would you like a cup of tea? Well, hey, cool. So it's worked out that that was relatively clear. My pronunciation was on point, and the volume was also pretty pretty level. Um, if you record in different settings and over a longer period of time, you're going to get massive inconsistencies in how all of this data was captured, and therefore you're going to end up with a relatively inconsistent model. So sitting down, doing it all in one consistent environment, trying to keep your voice relatively similar as well would be, uh, would be pretty helpful. Now, uh, I will just show you uh, again, if I click next, it now takes me on to the next utterance, and I can keep keep going. Um, of course, it will pick up any mistakes I make. So if I say, when do we want to eat? Oh, it worked. <laughs> okay. Um, there, was a, there was a couple of examples where, okay, we'll, we'll do this one. The textbook said everything about where the battery is. So I've said some keywords, but it's picked up that, okay, I didn't say manual. Uh, it's worked out that I omitted that word. Um, it should have detected that I had some insertions there because I put extra words in. It didn't. It's not uh, completely accurate. And it worked out I missed a couple of other words as well. Also, I was, spoke, I was speaking too loud. It's complained about it. Um, I don't trust that volume detector because I've equally said things really quietly and it said, no, 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 that was way too loud. And then stuff way too uh, loud and it's been absolutely fine. But uh, I think it differs really per utterance. Now, they have examples here as well of just how this would sound if I wanted to uh, get an example, a feel for it. The manual said nothing about the location of the battery. So if you were to 
effectively mimic what that said, you're going to pretty much get a, a, nice, uh, a nice output. This is going to take 15 minutes if I was to do this, and then I'd have to go train it. So uh, we'll skip to the actual model that I've made already, which is this one. Um, I've completed all my recordings, and just as an example, here is one of the phrases that I was recorded saying. It's hard to deny that tomatoes are the ideal summer food. I agree, I love tomatoes. Um, this has gone through, through my training. As you can see, it says, yep, you've got your 50 samples. Uh, it took me about 15 minutes, and I've then hit my train model button here. Doing that, I have to sign another disclaimer, and it will, uh, it will go off and train my model. That takes around, they claim 0.8 hours, it's about an hour and a half in reality, so it's, it's nearly double what they suggest it is. But I have generated my voice model. And I can click into that, and I can start to review these samples. Uh, as I said, this is the light tier, so I don't have full control over what this uh, sounds like, but here is my final trained voice based on what I fed into it. Congratulations. You have successfully created your synthetic voice with custom neural voice light. I think that's pretty impressive. I've done 15 minutes of speaking to a computer, and I have a fairly human-sounding uh, voice. It does sound like my voice. It's definitely got the key characteristics. There's a few robotic elements in there, but maybe that was down to my training data. Let's try another To deploy one. your voice model and use it in your business applications, you must get the full access to custom neural voice. Yeah, that one's a bit more robotic. But uh, there's, a, there's a huge array here of, of different sentences that sort of shows actually just how easy this was. If I have the pro access, I can take this model and I can deploy it and I can start using it in custom text-to-speech. Uh, I don't have to uh, use the full-blown pro training set either. I can use the light training and then deploy that uh, anywhere I want. When we say the word deploy here, that just means make that available within my... Uh, within my cognitive services account. Uh, to prove as well, I had a bit of fun with this, to prove just how disastrous it could be if you don't give it good data, I recorded the entire 50 samples in a monotone voice as well. And, uh, well, I'll, I'll show you that same tomatoes example of what I recorded. It's hard to deny that tomatoes are the ideal summer food. Yes. I could sound far more enthusiastic. Um, and this was what the output was. Congratulations. You have successfully created your synthetic voice with custom neural voice light. OK, so this really shows how important it is that we train our AI with good data, our model with good data. We give it, uh, you know, give it your all. Do all the expression. Um, try and be enthusiastic, even if you sound a bit silly saying some of the sentences, and you'll get a relatively accurate result. If you aren't enthusiastic about it, it's not going to be very good. Um, so yeah, that was how we could train up a, a very simple uh, neural voice project. Um, I can close this off now, I think, because that was a disaster. There we go, back to the slides. So these were the tips that Microsoft popped up for me. Um, use a good microphone. I think I've proven that this isn't quite the case. I can use my laptop mic and still get a relatively decent result. Um, if you've got a rubbish laptop mic, maybe don't do it. It says stay about eight inches away from your microphone to avoid mouth noises, such as that sibilance that we talked about earlier. But I still don't think that's quite true because there's been times where I've been a foot and a half away and it said it was too loud and equally I've been right next to the microphone and it said it was too quiet. So uh, take this with, with what you will. Uh, my experience was as you've done this a few times you sort of get used to what it's asking for um, and you can quite easily adapt your voice if it says something's wrong. Avoid background noise. Well, I have police cars and sirens and motorbikes going past my window and I was fine. So it, it still worked. Relax, speak naturally. 100% this, yes, because uh, as, you show, as I showed with my monotone example, if you sound like an idiot, the AI is going to sound like an idiot too. Uh, record in one take. I did say this earlier. You've got to keep your energy consistent to try and make the most uh, consistent data set as possible. Review the quality metrics. That's the, the sort of uh, those samples that we had there um, to say whether you were good or pronouncing things wrong, and then uh, record as many samples as possible. These principles are, are pretty obvious if you're going to do something on a bigger scale. You want the quality to be as good as it possibly can. Now, what about accents? I, everyone has an accent, let's not deny that. But uh, I would say I've, got a, I've not got an overly overwhelming accent. Um, I'm just typically British. But even in the UK, we have 40 different dialects. 
Um, if you're from, you're anyone from Europe in here that's not from, anyone not from the UK? A couple of people. Oh, loads of people. Excellent. This is going to be exciting for you then. Um, obviously, if you speak English or another language, you'll have an accent. If I try and speak French or Spanish, I have a British twang to everything I say. If Americans try and speak British English, they sound ridiculous. Um, you know, all of these things. It, uh, Accents matter, and the AI or the, the model we're training also needs to be aware of those things. Um, so the supported languages, I'm sorry, Danny, there isn't Dutch on here, but we have uh, English with four different, let's call them dialects, uh, UK, Australia, uh, Canada, and the US, French, German, Italian, Japanese, Korean, Mandarin, Chinese, Portuguese, but only for Brazil, which is weird, uh, I guess, again, just sample size, um, and then Spanish for Spain and Mexico different dialects, and it's important that you choose that correct uh, locale when you set up your model, because it's going to train you on a different model, depending on what you, you chose. Um, yeah, so my girlfriend is French, and for a bit of fun yesterday, I said, can we train a model on you? And she said, fine, okay. She'd been to the pub. She, she was going to humor me. Um, she came to the UK seven or eight years ago, spoke very, very little English. She's learned English from me, from working here, from working in hospitality, picking up other people's accents. London's an incredibly multicultural city. We've got hundreds and hundreds of cultures here. And so she's got a very interesting blend of an accent, shall we say. So I decided, let's try and train you as a UK English speaking female, but with your accent and let's see what happens. Because I think, again, for some of the people in this room, you may be trying to train a US English model that is not really designed for your accent. How does it handle that? Let's have a look. Um, so yeah, we're back over here onto my, uh, my uh, speech studio, and I have created um, uh, a Franglish project, let's call it. Um, she's done amazing. She's gone and recorded the full, the full 50 as well. It took... Um, it took about 20 minutes, whereas mine was 15. So for a non-native speaker, I think that's pretty impressive. Uh, I'll use the same example again, the, the tomatoes one. This is what she normally sounds like. It's hard to deny that tomatoes are the ideal summer food. OK, so there's a few Franglish-isms in there, shall we say. Um, the French typically speak very fast. Uh, they, they, they kind of <laughs> conjoin words as well sometimes. Um, uh, T's or the's become z's. And uh, it, it does start to change, really, how uh, the language sounds. Now, uh, this is what we trained it on. And this is what it sounds like. Congratulations. You have successfully created your synthetic voice with custom neural voice light. See, I find that incredibly interesting. Because, uh, of course, I know my girlfriend's voice. I can, I can detect more of the, the patterns in there. But it has picked up most of the common things that she says, it's, it is her voice, but there's also a lot of elements where it's made her sound more English, where she's got certain pronunciations. I think the word successfully here sounds incredibly English. Congratulations. You have successfully created your synthetic voice with custom voice Created, synthetic. Light. Those words don't sound like her, but it's undeniably still her voice. So this shows actually how the model uh, really matters. Uh, there is no Franglish model we can train it on, but if I, if I wanted to, we could probably iron out those uh, Englishisms to actually get a, a, you know, a representative voice. But if we talk about, you know, just in the UK, maybe someone from Newcastle, they have a very strong dialect, a very strong accent. This is probably going to try and make them sound more like the core model. And when you look at the, the, the samples that they've got, they've not got any regional accents in there. They've all got let's say, Queen's English standard uh, voices. And uh, it's a bit of a shame. So it, it would be nice to see some things like that. Um, we also, just for fun, trained a French model because she's a native French speaker. Now, this was an experience because... Uh, this is all in French. I don't, I don't speak French. I'm sorry. I, I, uh, these are different phrases. So these phrases are specifically chosen for the model to make sure it's going to train in the most broadest sense possible. It's going to gather as much data as it possibly needs to. Um, let's just choose one of these. This is my girlfriend speaking French. 
incredibly fast. Uh, to be fair, even her family say they can't understand her when she speaks French, so uh, I, think she, I think she might be an exception. Um, we've, we've trained all of, all of this model. However, it took 40 minutes. 40 minutes. My girlfriend was able to train the English model far easier than she was the French model. Ironically, one of the sentences she got stuck on, and I'm not going to try and pronounce this, said in English, it's just a matter of time for me to get there. So very ironically, she spent about five minutes trying to pronounce that one, and the, the model just wasn't having it at all. Um, it took twice as long. And this is really interesting, because I think it is because of the subtleties of the French language. Their T's are far softer. They have uh, more of these conjoined words. They have much faster speech. Um, also, just like in the UK, significant regional differences. Um, however, the output sounds undeniably like her and uh, I think is incredibly impressive. Félicitations. Vous avez créé votre voix de synthèse avec succès avec la fonctionnalité voix neuronale personnalisée light. I would not have been able to tell that that wasn't her speaking French. And again, I don't know the French language that much. Maybe to a native French speaker, that would be obvious. But uh, she was pretty impressed. The one thing we did notice here, though, is uh, that it was far more formal. And the training data, whilst for the uh, English sentences, was more, would you like a cup of tea? How's your day going? This was more business language. So perhaps just based on their model or the data they've trained it on, that's just, that's just how things go. I'll, I'll take a question at the end, Denny, if that's all right. Um, so yeah, this is, this is that. There's a few other things, subtleties uh, for people that... Is everyone on French in? My girlfriend's French. Your girlfriend's French. So I had the same thought. You had the same thing. I'm going to get her to do this. Excellent. And then you answered the question. Excellent. Well, so, so you will know that there's also some other subtleties to the French language, which, uh, as a language, it's far more physical than many other languages. They have a very common word, which is... Uh, they have facial expressions, which again, you can't really get those across in a model. And whilst, okay, I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but those are actually an integral part of communicating in French. So again, perhaps the, uh, the formality comes from the fact that the language itself, let's say book French, is a bit more like uh, what we trained it on, but a bit more formal, whereas the... Uh, whereas the uh, conversational French is, is a little bit more flexible and a bit more varied. Um, again, I know in, in French you have more, uh, say, respectable language that you'd use to talk to an elder, a grandparent, or a parent than you maybe would your friends. So this model doesn't really understand those subtleties. Anyway, yeah, I was quite impressed. We were able to train a French-sounding French model on this, and it works very, very well. For the Frenglish one, not so well. Félicitations. Oh, sorry. Vous avez... <laughs> let's, uh, let's just jump back to there, and we will go back to my slides. Okay, so we're going to have to skip over a bit of this anyway, which is kind of helpful because I've talked more than I thought I would anyway. Um, we don't have the access to the demo, but I will just briefly talk about what training a pro um, model would sound like. So it's far more high quality, they claim. I thought the French one was pretty high quality. Um, the English one's passable, um, but it's much more natural sounding, apparently. It requires a much larger data set, 300 to 2,000 utterances. Now, they aren't going to make you sit there and record 3,000 utterances in one go. This is really more designed for those professional studio setups where you'd get a professional voice artist to come in and uh, record them. They do have a bunch of sample uh, transcripts, though. So they can say, go record this 300, 500 uh, utterances and give us the MP3, and that will work. Um, if, if you really wanted to do that. You can train up to 15 different styles. Styles isn't something that's supported in anything other than US English at present, but styles could be things like uh, being sad, angry, terrified, whispering even, um, which is quite cool. Uh, they also have this technology called style transfer, where you don't have to record the various different styles, but you could actually uh, record a generic model, and then they will do their best with an algorithm to apply that to the various other styles as well. Um, to train this, you have to upload an MP3 and a transcript. But actually, in preview currently, there's a feature where you can just send it the MP3. And they'll use the Azure available services to go and transcribe that for you, and then train the model with their generated transcript. If you care about accuracy, that's not the approach to use. But if you're trying to just train something quickly, sure, that's, that's going to work. Um, 
I've said here it has to be professional recordings, but it could also be a conference talk or a recording of your calls or even a podcast episode. Uh, and I wish I could show you this demo now because I have three examples from each of those different uh, cases. I've recorded some Zoom calls where it's just my audio. I've recorded a conference talk where you get a bit of interference um, from the microphones, but it's generally pretty clear. And then a podcast where it's a lot of discussion with other people and that sort of uh, chops and... Uh, chops and changes. Um, the call recording was absolutely the best quality model that got generated. Um, it was pretty much exactly like my voice. It's exactly how I sound on calls, frustrated usually. Um, the conference talk again was, was a little bit fuzzy, but actually pretty good, just down to the quality of the recording there. And the podcast, I do a podcast with my uh, friend in Poland. He's got a Ponglish accent, we call it, uh, or he calls it in fact. And uh, I sounded a little bit Polish. So you know, take, take from that what you will. Quality of the data is important. I didn't put any transcripts in with these though. Training takes about 24 hours, which is a long time, especially if you're trying to work on a demo and go, I really want to see how this came out and you have to wait a whole day of training. It, it's not fantastic. Um, but yeah, we'll uh, very, very quickly, because I know I'm in the way of you and lunch, just set up a, a pro project quickly so I can show you what those options look like. I select pro, uh, I fill in all of my details. We'll call this one. NDC London Pro, um, I'm male and United Kingdom. It's the same options because it's the same models. I click create and it will instantly create my project. I go to the project. I now have to define a voice talent because I can have multiple speakers and train it with multiple data sets. I have to set the exact target scenario and this has to match the target scenarios that I told Microsoft I was gonna use this for to make sure I'm not creating a fake Troy Hunt or something. Um, and then I can, uh, let's just say it's self-authored content, click continue. Uh, I have to then record and upload a statement to say, this is me uh, and I, I, I know what I'm doing type thing. We'll just cancel that one out. The training data, you can add multiple sets of data. And as I said, there's a variety of options there. Uh, let's just call this one again, uh, NDC uh, and click create. And it then lets me upload data to that training set so I can choose my individual utterances where I've recorded 300 to 2,000 utterances with in a zip file where I have a WAV audio file per utterance and a transcript. It's a lot of work to get right. Um, or you could take a one long audio file plus a corresponding transcript or just the audio only option like I said. You click next, you upload your data up to two gigs of data and it will go away and train it for you. Um, I unfortunately can't show you that but oh well. Say la vie. Uh, all righty. So before I wrap up, what about accuracy? We've already looked at different accents and how those could uh, perhaps change your, your custom voice, but there might be words that people don't say correctly or the, the model actually doesn't understand correctly, say, from your transcript. Um, I mentioned right at the start that I work with a CMS called Umbraco, U-M-B-R-A-C-O. There's a video on YouTube that says, so how do you pronounce Umbraco? and it's 15 people saying it completely differently. There is no common consensus, really, on how it's said. I say umbraco, other people say umbraco, umbraco, um, umbraco. Uh, and it was very interesting to try and plumb that into my model and see, well, how does it pronounce this? Um, so we can go back to the, uh, we can go back to the uh, speech studio here just for a second, uh, and I can go to uh, a feature called uh, the audio content creation service, which is here. Now, my audio content creation service allows me to supply a lexicon file to basically say, this is for these words, these terms, when these come up in your text-to-speech scenarios, you need to pronounce them like this. Uh, I'm able to supply um, an international phonetic alphabet uh, syntax, a phoneme, for how my words should be pronounced. And it will take that, it will understand that, and apply that straight to my model. So uh, if I show you here, I've created a file called ENGB. It's got a couple of common scenarios in it uh, for by the way and hello, which it specifies out of the box. And I've added Umbraco with my pronunciation in there. It took me a very long time to work out <laughs> what that actually was, but this is how I want to pronounce it. Oops. Um, now, when we go back into the uh, creation studio, I can also create my own test project. It doesn't like working in Safari, but it does work. Um, so here, this is how a US English female speaker, a US, uh, sorry, a UK English male speaker, and a uh, UK 
English female speaker would pronounce that word. Let's just have a look. And then it always fails to play on the first time. Umbraco. 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 Okay. So I'm not hugely happy with that. The, the US English one was kind of right, but it was Umbraco. Uh, the uh, the uh, UK ones were Umbraco. I'm not having that. That's not acceptable in my world. So I can, uh, I can train my... Uh, I can tell my model, uh, you should use this lexicon file instead. And I can go into this, and I can then choose my lexicon from the one I've created, ENGB. It's tied to a culture, so it has to match the culture of the, uh, of the model that's been used, and that's now applied. Let's see how this sounds. Umbraco. Umbraco. Yay. Umbraco. So it's taken the lexicon file. It's now pronouncing my words correctly. You can imagine if you're using this in a business context, it would be very, very important to get say, the pronunciation of your company correct. Um, this is exactly what that's for. Uh, we can also do far more tweaking, like uh, for this US English one, it gives us a lot more options. Uh, control the, the rate, the speed, the pitch, and even uh, do some more exciting things like, um, let's do a, a thing here, hurry up. Oh, OK, let's try that again. Hurry up, it's lunchtime. And I can give that a, uh, a voice. We'll go with a US English voice, because then I'm able to change some things. Um, we'll say, we'll go with uh, Davis this time. Hey, Davis. Uh, we can just delete the top one. Hurry up, it's lunchtime. So by default, that would be pronounced. Hurry up, it's lunchtime. He sounds quite enthusiastic about that. Um, but we can change the speaking style. And we could say, instead, it needs to be uh, you know, angry. Is there an angry? Angry. Let's see how this sounded different. Hurry up, it's lunchtime. Seemingly his voice has changed pitch there as well. Um, <laughs> uh, we could make it him sound like a, uh, you know, a friendly person. And... Hurry up, it's lunchtime. That's not so friendly. Um, we can make him sound... Uh, we can, let's, let's try the whispering one as well. Hurry up, it's lunchtime. That's pretty cool, right? How I'm able to, to change uh, all of these attributes. Um, and there's a whole lot more that we can do, but we, we really don't have that much time. OK, so uh, just to wrap up, what are some potential use cases of this? Uh, it's great fun playing around with, and uh, it's, it's really cool to see what we can do. But there's actually some serious use cases. I think an obvious one would be telephony, so a call center, when you call up an automated uh, voice guiding through, you through your options. You want that to sound as human as possible. Um, I would say the most important ones are the accessibility element that this could bring. Because this technology could be used for a variety of contexts. Um, accessibility, if you imagine someone who's uh, got a hearing impairment, they are, let's say, deaf or deaf mute, born unable to, to hear, those people really struggle. And uh, if they have to, you know, if they receive a call from an uh, energy supplier, it's typically an energy supplier, um, they'll say, that some of these companies offer services where they can have a, a, a transcription, but it's, it's not super easy. You can imagine if this technology was widely available and easily used, someone could have a voice that's sort of trained based on their characteristics to sound like what they may sound like and to communicate for them via a text-to-speech interface. There are a few services out there that do this. Equally, speech disorders, if you aren't confident with public speaking or recording or on phone calls, maybe this sort of technology could be helpful. Um, the translation element's pretty cool. Uh, as I said, you can, uh, you can train your voice to speak other languages too. So a US English voice can be said, actually, you've trained this model, I now want you to speak Spanish. And they will, based on another model that they have of speakers who spoke both English and Spanish, they will adjust and adapt your model to, uh, to work in that context. And it's fairly accurate. I've not been able to get one up and running. Security is a big one. You can imagine having a, a, a simple trained model on what your voice sounds like could be a really helpful way to, say, authorize a payment to your bank or something. Um, HSBC in the UK are currently doing this. You can have a telephone banking voice password, and it will confirm that it's you saying that voice password. That's pretty cool. Uh, virtual assistants as well, or even maybe as a time capsule. There's, there's sometimes in everyone's lives, maybe voices that they want to hold on to, memories they want to hold on to forever. Um, a loved one, or perhaps David Attenborough or Morgan Freeman, we could turn their voice into a model and uh, have them kind of, you know, encapsulated in time forevermore. Um, some quick FAQs before we finish. How much does it cost? 
It's not cheap. I'm sorry. Uh, it's $52 per training hour, which, if my model takes an hour and a quarter to train, is expensive. It's like 70 bucks. Um, four models, $250 type thing. Um, it's not cheap. Uh, and then when you've deployed those, once you've uh, created that, it creates an endpoint for you to consume that model, and that costs $4 an hour to keep running. If you were doing this on a big scale, it would make sense. If you're going to do this for a pet project, it probably doesn't make sense unless you're loaded. Um, how can you use it in your app? I can think of so many scenarios where this would be really helpful to, say, bake into a, a Xamarin or a Maui app or even an iOS or an Android app or a web app. Well, there is a .NET SDK, a JavaScript SDK, C++ Go, Python, Objective-C, the whole, the, whole, the, whole, uh, the whole farm. So this is pretty straightforward to use. Uh, do you have to create a custom voice? Absolutely not. There's 400 plus voices with different uh, attributes and styles available, uh, and you can go and use those out of the box. You don't have to do any training. Um, and are there open source options? Yes, but you're going to have to spend a lot of time training and hosting, and you're going to need quite a lot of compute to do them. Uh, Whisper is a new one by OpenAI. There's a white paper out for that at the moment. It looks really, really powerful. Deep Speech is one from Mozilla, and Mimic is one from a company called Mycroft. It sounds very, very realistic, that one. Um, it's just a, a British man, and they've not got any other variations, though, so the others actually have a, a few more options. Um, but that's sort of a, a summary of, of what the landscape looks like, shall we say. And finally, I'm sorry I've gone over five minutes. I'll, I'll let you go to your lunch. But that was from me. I'm on, uh, I'm on GitHub and Twitter. I'd love to have a chat after, maybe around the event. I'll be around all day. Um, and uh, yeah, let me know what you thought or maybe some ideas that you've come up with. Thank you.